Okay, gang, we're in the home stretch here. Chapter 11, Portable Fire Extinguishers. And we would be remiss if we actually didn't spend a little time talking about portable fire extinguishers as they are a key component to any fire protection system. Objectives. Discuss the fire extinguisher classification system. List the different extinguishing agents and their applications. Discuss the fire extinguisher rating system and identify which classifications of extinguishers it applies. Explain why a certain extinguisher classification requires a conductivity test. And describe the different types of fire extinguishers and how they operate. Explain the acronym PASS in relation to fire extinguish operations. Discuss the inspection, testing, and maintenance procedures for portable fire extinguishers. Portable fire extinguishers are a valuable suppression tool. They are used at the incipient stage of a fire or on fires where water would not be effective. They must be quickly accessible and the correct type for the class of fire they're being used on. There is a fixed amount of suppressant agent in each extinguisher. Rapid access prevents fire growth beyond the extinguisher's capacity to control. Using the wrong type of agent can result in ineffective suppression. The person using the extinguisher must be properly trained. Improper use results in ineffective suppression. Extinguishers are labeled for the type of fire they are intended to fight, requiring minimal training and are designed for easy use. Typical extinguishers need only a few components. Components may include a cylinder, a discharge nozzle and hose, or a discharge horn, a discharge trigger, and a locking mechanism, a carrying handle, and a pressure gauge. The cylinder holds the suppression agent, which is released when the trigger is activated. The nozzle slash horn directs the agent on to the fire. The carrying handle makes it easier to move. The locking mechanism, which is traditionally a pin inserted into the trigger, prevents accidental discharge. The pressure gauge indicates if there is sufficient pressure to discharge the agent. Knowledge of extinguishers and suppression agents enable firefighters and building occupants to select and operate the right extinguisher during a fire. Code requirements for installations of portable fire extinguishers are included in the model code. This requirement focuses on the use and occupancy conditions of a building. Additional requirements exist for managing specific hazards, industrial processes, equipment, and special events. The International Building Code requires extinguishers in almost every new occupancy classification. The International Fire Code has additional information and requirements, such as certification of service personnel, inspection, testing, and maintenance. Both agencies follow the installment, excuse me, the installation requirements and guidelines of NFPA 10, which is a standard for portable fire extinguishers. NFPA 1 Fire Code an NMPA 101 Life Safety Code and NMPA 5000 Building Construction Code requires installation in new and existing use and occupancy classifications. The one across the board exception is one and two family dwellings. There are also a few differences between the codes and additional requirements and exceptions in each. NMPA 101 does not require fire extinguishers for new or existing educational occupancies, but NFPA 1 and NFPA 5000 do. Both NFPA 101 and 5000 do not require fire extinguishers in hotels or apartments when an approved and supervised automatic fire sprinkler system is installed throughout the building. Requirements for installation, testing, and maintenance of portable fire extinguishers originate within NFPA 10. NFPA 10 is a minimum guide for people who select, purchase, install, and approve, list, design, and maintain portable extinguishing equipment. 
NFPA 10 was recognized as the standard in 1921. There has been over 36 editions since then to keep up with research, changing technology, and new suppression products. It is critical to assess the amount and type of available fuel so that the correct size fire extinguisher and the appropriate suppression agents are available for use. The fire classification system establishes the basis for determining the appropriate extinguishing agent. Class A fires are those involving ordinary combustibles such as cloth, grain, and paper. Suppression is used in the form of water, Form, uh, foam or dry chemical agents. Your class B fires involve your flammable and combustible liquid agents and its suppression agent traditionally is carbon dioxide, foam, and some dry chemical agents. Class C fires involve energized electrical equipment. And for your suppression agents there are no specific agents which is best to eliminate the source of electrical energy first and after you do that then it falls into a traditional class A or class B fire. Class D fires involve combustible metals such as aluminum, magnesium, and potassium and the suppression agent of choice for that is your dry powder agents. Finally we have a class K fires which remember involve cooking oil and its suppression agent is some sort of wet chemical that mixes with the oil and turns it into like a fatty gel substance and that's known as saponification. The same lettering system used to classify fires is labeled on the extinguishers to indicate the class and fuel they combat. Some have multiple classifications because the agent works well on different materials. They have labels with multiple letters and icons depicting the type of fire. As seen here, you have your A, B, C, and D. Notice the different classifications as well as the cool pictures here on the side to help differentiate what the extinguisher is used for. Water is one of our best agents because it can absorb more heat per pound than any other material known. It is the most effective on Class A fires. It is not effective on some fuels and is dangerous to use with others. Extinguishers using water must be located in an area to avoid cold conditions as water can freeze and make the extinguisher useless unless they're mixed with some sort of antifreeze but then you got to be cautious when you use antifreeze because at certain ratios it can be uh, mixed and it can be flammable. Foam is also a good agent for class A and even better agent for your class B fires. This is because it becomes a vapor barrier between the fuel in the atmosphere, thus basically suffocating the fire, preventing the oxygen from mixing with the fuel. To make foam, the agent is discharged through a special aspirating nozzle so that it can mix with the air. There are two types of foam that are used in fire extinguisher. You have AFFF, which, which is aqueous film forming foam and triple FP which is film forming fluoroprotein. NPA 10 states the foams are not as effective in flammable liquid fires that are under pressure or on, on grease fires related to cooking. Foam mixes with the water so it does not work well of course in freezing temperatures. Carbon dioxide is an effective agent for your class B and class C fires. It has limited use on Class A fires. In the tank, carbon dioxide is in a high pressure liquid state. It expands to a gas upon release. The tank does not have pressure gauges and the quantity of agent is determined by the weight of the tank. These extinguishers are heavier than others of comparable size and rating. Carbon dioxide gas depletes the oxygen surrounding a fire and to a limited degree cools the fuel source. 
The agent must be discharged at close range so that air movement does not carry the gas away. In a confined space, the operator must have an oxygen supply available to avoid asphyxiation. Dry chemicals are small solid particles that are propelled by pressurized gas. Upon discharge, the chemical covers the burning material and decreases the oxygen concentration around it, effectively smothering it. Dry chemicals are not dangerous or toxic, but they can create a cloud that limits visibility and may cause some respiratory problems. Some leave a corrosive residue that is especially damaging to electronic equipment when exposed to moisture. There are three categories of this dry powdered agent, sodium bicarbonate, based, potassium based, and a multi-purpose, such as ammonium phosphate. The sodium bicarb base, this type works well on your Class B and Class C fires and is classified as a regular dry chemical. It is one of the most widely used dry chemicals and is very effective on grease fires when related to cooking. It is still common in homes, but is not approved for commercial kitchens. It is a white or blue in color powder. Potassium bicarbonate or potassium chloride or urea-based potassium bicarbonate. This type works well in your class B and C fires and are classified as a regular dry chemical. It is similar to the sodium bicarbonate but more effective because lesser amounts have more extinguishing capabilities. It is purple in color. The ammonium phosphate, this type works well on your Class A, Class B, and Class C fires. It is yellow in color. All dry chemicals have certain chemical properties that should never be mixed. Wet chemicals. Wet chemicals are the primary and most effective agent for those Class K fires. They are water-based sodium that mixes with potassium carbonate acetate or citric or some mixture of these and other additives. When applied, they react with the fat in the cooking medium of the food, create that soapy foam blanket and smothers the fire. Liquid in the agent cools the cooking medium to help maintain the foam blanket. Dry powders are the best method for extinguishing Class D combustible metal fires, which can often be difficult to control. No one dry powder works on every fire. Some of the sodium-based agents from a crust on the burning material to deplete the oxygen. Graphite-based agents conduct heat away from the fuel. It is again important to know which agent works and which particle type of combustible metal fire. Some do not work in an extinguisher and are applied by scoop shovel or handle. Halon and other clean agents. Although halon are effective and are still unused, they are being phased out because of environmental concerns. They leave no residue and they do not conduct electricity and are more effective than the same amount of CO2. However, they are somewhat toxic. Exposures can f cause physical problems such as vertigo, loss of agility, and loss of coordination. Halon 1211 and Halon 1311 are still in use. There is a new generation of clean agents that are more environmentally friendly and nearly as effective. And that's your Halon carbon-based agents, and they consist of hydrochlorofluorocarbon or hydrofluorocarbon. They are an inert gas consisting of measured combinations of gas that are proportion to basically interrupt combustion. Mainly argon, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen are the agents that are, are used to help put out the fire. Neither halocarbons nor the inert gases leave a residue or conduct electricity, and both are safe for the environment and humans. Class A and B extinguishing groups have an additional number rating to establish their performance capability. 
The number represents how much fire the extinguisher should be able to handle based on testing criteria from a standard. ANSI and UL 711 rating and testing of fire extinguishers was developed by UL and adopted by the American National Standard Institute to establish the testing criteria. Class A extinguishers can be rated 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, 6A, 10A, 20A, and 40A. 1A to 20A are based on indoor test. 30 and 40 are based on outdoor test. Each increment of 1 listed before the letter indicates that the extinguisher has the same capacity to extinguish fire as 1.25 gallons of water. A 4A extinguisher would be equal to using 5 gallons of water. The higher the rating, the larger the extinguisher is. Class B extinguishers are tested by setting a flammable liquid fire in a pan. The rating is determined based on the pan size and is proportionate to its square footage. A 120B extinguisher means that there should be no product to extinguish a 120 square foot pan fire. As the fire becomes larger, a greater amount of the agent is needed and the relationship is not as proportional. Ratings include 1B, 2B, 5B, 10B, 20B, 30B, 40B, 60B, 80B, 120B, 160B, 240B, 320B, 480B, and 640B. Class 1B through 20B are based on indoor fire test, and Class 3 and above are based on outdoor fire test. Class C extinguishers do not have a rating because <clears throat> there is no fire test for Class C agents. There is a test to see if there is a conductivity between the agent and the horn, hose, and nozzle and electrolyzed energized source. The agent is discharged onto an electrically charged plate that is placed 10 inches away from the extinguisher nozzle. The desired result for the agent and equipment is to be non-conductive so there is no risk of arcing and shocking and so that people using the extinguisher are not injured. Pump extinguishers. Pump extinguishers are manually operated via power mechanism. This creates pressure in the tank which allows the extinguisher and the water agent to be dispelled. These extinguishers are easy to use and refill. The most important is that water be kept in the tank and they usually have a capacity between 5 and 2.5 gallons. The pumping mechanism may be internal or external. An internal pumping mechanism is immersed in the water tank and each stroke of the handle pumps water out of the tank through the hose <coughs> and out of the nozzle. Similar mechanism to a floor type bicycle pump. The external pump mechanism is similar to the handheld bicycle pump. It's used for backpack type extinguishers and is common in rural and wilderness area. This type kind of reminds me of the old fashioned super soakers for those of you that remember that. And those that don't, well, you're making me feel old. Stored pressure extinguishers. A pressurized gas and extinguisher agents are mixed in the same tank. The gas, which is air or nitrogen, is stored above the agent, keeping a constant pressure on it. The pressure of the gas forces the agent out of the tank and through the nozzle or the horn. An operator can determine if there is sufficient pressure in the tank to discharge the agent by looking at the pressure gauge. These extinguishers use a variety of agents such as water, an antifreeze, a wetting agent, a loaded stream, foam, dry chemical, wet chemical, dry powder, or halon. Cartridge pressure extinguishers. This is similar to the stored pressure extinguisher, but the gas is stored in a separate cartridge attached to the side of the tank instead of within the extinguishing tank. When the extinguisher is activated, it punctures the cartridge and the gas is expelled into the tank and forces the agent out. Because the cartridge is sealed, there is no need for a pressure gauge, but there is a lack of constant pressure. The top can be removed without dumping the agent or losing pressure. 
The extinguisher facilitates easy maintenance of certain agents. <clears throat> it is its use loaded stream, or excuse me, it uses a loaded stream foam, dry chemical, and dry powder agents. Obsolete types of fire extinguishers. There are many fire extinguishers and types that are no longer approved for use. Some are unsafe, and some contain products that are conductive or corrosive. And MPA 10 lists the extinguishers and products that should not be in service, such as the old-fashioned soda acid extinguishers. And these were kind of neat. Uh, these were the brass copper type extinguishers. You may even see some aluminum out there where they had basically carbonated water mixed with a bicarbonate that created a fizzing action forcing uh, the water to expel from the tank. You would basically flip it upside down. And if you ever see one, they're kind of neat, especially if it still has the guts in them. So take time and uh, take them apart. Another type is a chemical foam. Uh, we also have a vaporizing liquid, a cartridge open water or loaded stream, copper or brass shell joined by soft solder or rivet, carbon dioxide extinguisher with metal horns, and any solid charge type A, triple F. Uh, any pressurized water extinguisher made before 1971, and any extinguishers that need to be inverted for operation. Stored pressure extinguishers made before 1955 are also not recommended. And any extinguishers rated 4B, 6B, 8B, 12B, or 16B. Stored pressure water extinguishers with a fiberglass shell are also not recommended. So there's a whole list here of things that are now obsolete. Even if a person has little or no training, he or she should be able to operate your fire extinguisher. Most portable extinguishers operate similarly. Hand-carried extinguishers use the uh, PASS acronym. And PASS is the acronym for pull, meaning pull the pin, aim the horn or the handle, of course squeeze the handle, and sweep across the base of the fire. So again, a person pulls the pin, aims the nozzle horn at the fire base, squeezes the trigger, and sweeps the nozzle horn until the agent runs out or the fire is out. Since the 1980s, extinguishers are required to be labeled with a pass pitch graph that are easily understood by the operator. People who might operate an extinguisher should also be familiar with the location of the extinguishers, their limitations, and the importance of notifying any building occupants to evacuate. It is also a good idea if you have fire extinguishers in your workplace that the workplace do actual training with fire extinguishers and you can a lot of times contact uh, the extinguishing company or your local fire department and they can conduct some actual hands-on live fire training for your folks so they can practice operating the extinguisher and feel comfortable if the time ever does arise that they need to use it. Inspection, testing, and maintenance are the key to ensuring that your portable fire extinguishers work properly when they are needed. These tasks are the responsibility of the property owner or the representative. People who perform inspection and tests must be trained and certified. The inspection, testing, and maintenance process involves many different activities. When conducted at the prescribed intervals, the process can identify impairments before they become a problem. With visual inspections, the extinguisher general condition can be determined in a short amount of time simply by observation. Inspection should take place at least every 30 days. Certain environments may require greater frequency. The following are part of the visual inspection. Is the extinguisher present, visible, and accessible? Does it have an inspection tag? Is it placed in the correct location? Is the extinguisher the proper type for the potential hazard and fuel load? Is it labeled and readily available? Is there any physical damage to the components? Are the components in working order? For your wheel types, are the wheels, tires, carriage, tanks, hose, and nozzles in good condition? Is the pressure gauge in the normal range? 
If there is no gauge, the weight is then checked, as in the case of your CO extinguisher. Some functions of the visual inspection are now performed through electronic monitoring systems that supervise the extinguishing agents and certain extinguisher parameters. Monitoring may also occur through the fire alarm system or a simple monitoring panel. Changes in normal parameters alert the monitoring center so that the problem can be investigated immediately. Problems may be detected early than during a monthly inspection cycle. NFPA 1 and the IFC recognizes electronic monitoring as a viable technology that permits longer periods between visual inspection as long as certain requirements are met. Maintenance. Maintenance procedures follow the manufacturer's recommended and usually are more thorough than a routine visual inspection. Maintenance usually occurs annually. It may occur sooner if dictated by the visual inspection or if the extinguisher has been discharged. All extinguishers must be internally examined at one, three, five, or six year intervals, except for the non-rechargeable type. This exam looks for conditions that could impair the extinguisher, such as corrosion, physical damage, broking, or missing parts. If maintenance inspection reveals a problem, the inspector must determine if the extinguisher can be repaired or requires more testing or should be discarded. Some additional maintenance tasks include the following. Disassembling or emptying out the extinguisher, cleaning, recharging, replacing the agent or repellent, replacing parts, and performing the conductivity test. Some maintenance tasks are dangerous, so personnel must have appropriate training, skills, and tools. Testing. The hydrostatic test is one of the most critical tests for the refillable extinguisher. It ensures the extinguisher will not fail due to unnoticeable conditions caused by corrosion and physical damage, manufacturing defects, and or heat exposure. Test occurs every 5 years or 12 years, but if physical damage or corrosion is discovered, the hydrostatic test should be performed immediately. The test involves disassembling the extinguisher, filling the component with at water, immersing it in water, and pressurizing the component. The components to be tested include the cylinder, cartridge, and hose assembly. Once the component passes the test, they must be dried, reassembled, recharged, and stamped with a new testing date. And that testing date will also have the company name and the testing pressure. Testing intervals are dictated by NFPA 10. And this should be every five years for your water-based extinguishers or every 12 years for your dry chemical stored pressure extinguishers with mild steel shells, braised brass shells, or aluminum shells. Your dry chemical cartridges or cylinder extinguishers operate with mild steel shells and halogenic extinguishers. These Periodic inspections, testing, and maintenance will ensure that the portable fire extinguisher should operate in a safe and effective manner when needed. Summary. The intended use of portable fire extinguishers is to suppress small incipient fires. Because portable extinguishers hold a fixed amount of suppression agents, there must be quick access, and the operator must know the proper use and handling of the extinguisher and the extinguishing agent must be suitable for the type of fire encountered. The types of suppression agent determines the extinguisher classification. Suppression agents used in different types of portable extinguishers include water, foam, carbon dioxide, dry chemical, wet chemical, dry powder, halon, and other clean agents. Some suppression agents work well on many different materials, but may not work with a particular category of extinguisher. In addition to receiving classification of Class A and Class B, extinguishers receive a rating that establishes their performance capability uh, with a numbering system. The express how much fire the extinguisher should be able to handle as compared to water. Generally, portable fire extinguishers fall into three categories, pump extinguishers, stored pressure extinguishers or cartridge pressure extinguishers. Pump extinguishers require a person to pump a handle manually to expel the suppression agent. 
Store pressure extinguishers use a gas that is contained with the suppression agent in the extinguisher's tank to expel the suppression agent. Cartridge pressure extinguishers have an external cartridge that holds a gas. Once punctured, these cartridges release the gas into the tank to expel the suppression agent. Okay, gang, make sure you take care of your review questions for this chapter. And if you have any questions, you can email me at aroberts at athenstech.edu or you can give me a call in the office at 706-357-0162. Until next time, be safe and have a wonderful day.